Welcome back, everybody, to the New Orleans Saints franchise. We have wrapped up two years in the series. Today, we're going to be looking back at year two, but also looking ahead to year three with the upcoming draft class and looking at how the league is changing with the rookies that have already made an impact on various teams and where our franchise is headed. But two years in, we have one playoff appearance. We've gone 15 and 19 over the regular season with an 0 1 playoff record. I picked the Saints for this series because they'd be a unique challenge compared to so many of my past series where the biggest hurdle was going to be managing this team's salary cap and building up a new core with limited resources. And I really expected in year two we'd have more success than we did. We were a pretty solid team in year one and I thought we had a pretty good team going into this year. And we opened the season with a 4-2 record with pretty good contributions from our rookie class. So from that point, I felt like, all right, this should be a playoff season for us. And then everything fell apart for our team and we struggled to win for weeks until the Chiefs game in week 15. We could have beaten the Giants the week prior. We had a couple close games, but... The team just wasn't the same after this Falcons game where the defense became a really big problem and the offense wasn't able to make up for it and we really got lost here in this stretch of games, struggling to even score 20 points. So clearly things had just gone off the rails too much and we moved on to Jake Hayner to try and see if he can be an option for our future. The reason I made that move ultimately is because... I really don't know what next year is going to look like in the series. This draft class upcoming, I was hoping would contain a quarterback for us. And there is not a starting quarterback that I can see in this class. I do like David Mayweather, but I think he is a future backup. Probably a pretty decent one. He might be worth a mid-round selection, but he's not going to give you much in terms of mobility, and he's really just a pocket passer who does have good accuracy but needs to get better at things like throwing under pressure. So I like Mayweather, but I'm not about to assume he can be a future starter and we're going to rely on that for next year. There isn't a first-round quarterback to take. We don't have cap space to go and pursue one of the top starters in free agency who this year for us would be Tua Tungavailoa. So I wanted to see if Jake Hayner could be the future starter or at least if he's not that great. Let's get a jump start on his development because we know what direction Derek Carr's career is headed. The Saints gave him a ridiculous contract. They refused to rebuild when Drew Brees retired and Sean Payton left. They wanted to keep the team together and slap the Derek Carr band-aid over the top of it with a massive contract that now I have to deal with. I have no idea yet if when I get to the offseason I can get out of some of this money. A lot of this money is likely guaranteed and I'm not going to just trade him to a random bad team with a bunch of cap space for like a, a seventh round pick just so I can get the money off the books. This is where I want to keep the series a bit more realistic and say, hey, this guy has no trade value. So either we cut him or we keep him, which is the same thing I did back in the Broncos franchise with Joe Flacco at the time. So my goal down the stretch was at the very least, let's get Jake Hayner a little development in case he is the starter next year, because that is possible. I don't want to play Derek Carr if he's just going to be regressing and the team isn't great to begin with. That just kind of doesn't give us any progress. Hayner is not as good as Derek Carr, but after another year of regression, the gap is going to be pretty close between the two. And at least we did get him some development thanks to that game against Kansas City. But overall, I look at this right here and I say there is no reason... We need to be throwing the ball 600 times a year. I'm already thinking about next year's offense, and I'm going to show you what I'm doing with the playbook because I've already gone and overhauled it a bit. I do not want to be throwing the ball 600 times next season if we're not excellent at throwing the football. This is ridiculous. 
so just looking at how the offense was run this year we passed the ball about 36 times a game and then got sacked a few times a game as well i think i've gotten a little bit better at uh taking less sacks but only if i could uh get a little better at throwing less interceptions we'll see about next year but as far as just running the ball we ran about 23, 24 times a game when you exclude like QB scrambles and QB sneaks. It's like 23 designed runs a game. And I think I want to get closer to 30 next year. And one thing I noticed by the end of the season, like I thought Kendra Miller did really well. And as far as maybe being a future starter with us, I felt like he showed he could do that this year, even with morale negatively affecting his ratings. But what I was noticing is that he would constantly get off to good starts. And then by the end of the game, you know, he's got 15 carries, 70 yards, 18 carries, 57 yards. It would seem that our most success came on those first couple drives. And what I'm wondering is if the run calls were getting too repetitive because I do believe in this game there is a degree of the CPU starting to counter plays better when you keep calling the same ones. So one thing I've already done for the playbook next year is I wanted to get way more run variety and not just run a bunch of inside zone and a lot of the same plays. So we're going to have more counters, zone split, trap, and it allows us to attack teams differently, depending on how I think we match up against them. But I think what we also need to do is find out what the rotation will be. So Alvin Kamara, we might keep him next year. We might end up trading him. It's hard to say. He's going to regress, probably lose his development after getting hurt and not putting up big numbers this year. So... Is there still some trade value? I might even say that this number's, you know, I don't think a team would be willing to take on that contract. So I might have to cut Camara, especially because we don't have much cap space to begin with. So the the issues here with this team, it's managing the, the cap that's a huge issue and then figuring out who's actually going to be part of this team's future from a talent standpoint. So... I did have a bunch of undrafted free agents I liked on this team. John Waters at times I thought looked good, but not nearly as good as Kendra Miller. And then Brian Johnson was used really as a receiving back. He had 3.4 yards a carry, broke one tackle on 26 rushes. So there's not really a huge need to give him too many carries. He's not really built to run between the tackles. So I'm not going to spend a premium pick or a lot of money on this role, but if we lose Kamara and it's Kendra Miller and the rest of these guys all over again, I'm probably going to try to get somebody else in here, likely a power back. So one thing I do think our team has going for it is a young and improving receiving core. Now, we didn't use Chris Olave nearly as much as in year one, especially because... I felt like it was more important to spread the ball around and develop this team if we weren't going to be as good as we were. But also, I clearly didn't throw it downfield to him quite as much if his yards per reception is down three full yards. But the emergence of A.T. Perry was definitely positive. I feel like he's on the right track. It still might take a little while. With that release being a little bit lower, he is kind of just kind of forced into this big slot role but he made a lot of plays for us this year, and I feel good about his development. And then there's Jacoby Pierman, who I feel like I had a good plan for early on. And then when, I, when the offense was getting stuck, I didn't really have a lot of great stuff dialed up for him. I didn't get the catch and runs I should have. I didn't take the vertical shots. I think I wanted to use him as just kind of a... Uh, not like a standard receiver, but running more of those standard routes, I guess, and less of the stuff that I think he could have gotten a little more production off of. He still had a really good year, though. Five receiving touchdowns, 700-plus yards. Didn't uh, do much on the runs and actually got credited with four fumbles. I don't think that's all on the 13 carries, but uh, four fumbles. I feel like I don't even remember more than one. Or two, actually. I remember two. 
But for sure next year, I want to find a way to get him more consistently involved in the offense, whether it's running or catching the football. And then, just like in year one, I feel like when we go to Jawan Johnson, it tends to work out for us, but maybe we don't do it enough. Now, I really like Jawan Johnson a lot, and the only way he's going to be able to come back next year is if we clear a fair amount of cap space. So, in case we can't, I did my homework on the tight ends in this upcoming class, and I do think it's a really strong rookie class to find a potential starter from. Then we got our running backs here who contribute a little bit in the passing game, but when Camaro went down, that was not as much of the plan. Jawan Jennings didn't do a whole lot as I relied primarily on the young receivers and even ended up trading away Josh Reynolds. Along the offensive line, I felt like at times we were really solid, but when we run into the, the better interior players, that's when Cesar Ruiz struggles. And I think Trevor Penning probably had a better year one in this series than year two. Like, he is a player who is going to struggle with the more athletic rushers. He's a better run blocking tackle than pass blocking. So unless we start being a lot more run heavy, he's not going to be a great fit with us. I did think Luke Rowe had a very up and down season as well. He is our rookie starting left guard. And I felt like he got, you know, pushed around at times in pass protection. He does struggle with that power better against finesse. But I think as a guard, you got to be able to hold up against power more so. So it's just going to take some more time. You know, he's got star dev. He's 22 years old. It's just a matter of time with him. As expected, Ryan Ramchek was excellent. The only issue is that to make cap space, we might have to consider trading a player like him. We really are low on space, and I don't think we're going to have the same situation this offseason where we have a bunch of rollover that helps us out. That was kind of more unique to year one. And then we go to our defense. This was uh, an interesting unit because I felt like I was constantly game planning around our weaknesses. But I still feel like by the end of the year, we got better and kind of found our identity. So immediately in this series, I went and drafted Tommy Tomlinson. I want to play man coverage. I like size at corner. Tomlinson was way too good to pass up in the first round last year. He ended up with five interceptions and had a, a pretty strong rookie season. We already had Marshawn Lattimore. We already had Paulson Adebo. So, cornerback was a really strong part of this team, but even the best corners can only do so much when they're constantly having to cover for three, four, five seconds with a struggling pass rush. And also, we blitz so much, these guys are constantly on islands. So, it's one of those things where you can't just look at the numbers you need the context behind them because we were one of the best teams in the NFL if all you care about is sacks. But we also blitz so much. Like, yeah, Demario Davis gets seven and a half sacks because he blitzed constantly. But as far as having good straight up one-on-one -on -one pass rushers, James Houston flashed at times. Brissy flashed here or there. But this team needs someone who can just beat the guy across from him my goal was to just get sacks and turnovers and i think for the most part we were able to do that but along the way we had one of the worst run defenses in all of football but i think i did figure out some things late in the season and i was actually really happy with this we actually climbed out of last place in run defense somebody did the breakdown in the comments on a recent video showing like fantasy score to running backs against us and we were giving up like 40 points a game to running backs during our worst stretch of the year and this is still not a great defense we had the worst scoring defense in the entire league second worst run defense but I do think if you look at our last five games where we really started to play a little bit differently and consistently we had really good games I thought against Patrick Mahomes against Justin Herbert now at the same time running the same defense we had a awful game against Bryce Young so do with that information what you will but I think these last four games showed improvement two teams only scored 17 the Chiefs 
with Patrick Mahomes only got to 23. We held Bijan Robinson to 70 yards on 22 carries with a long of 10. And even after giving up like 50 yards on the first two drives to Miles Sanders, we kept him under 100. When in our previous meeting, he went for 200. Things were so screwed up. So a big thing for me this year was to try and find answers going into year three. And I feel like I was able to do that defensively. And really all we did down the stretch was call uh, five-man pressures with man coverage. We're just calling cover one. And it seemed to help out the run defense. It seemed to just work overall. And I went further and further away from a lot of the zones that I've been able to play in a lot of my past series. Like with a defense that has excellent talent, I think you can just sit in cover three most of the time and hold teams under, you know, 22 points and just cruise. But you need really good talent to do that. When we sat in zones this year, especially on third downs, we were getting shredded. We did not have the pass rush and our linebackers, I thought, did a pretty bad job in coverage. Our best player there is Demario Davis, and he is regressing. And at times this year, I felt like his coverage had really regressed. And there isn't anybody else on this team that has the cover skill to take away tight ends or really do anything of note. So it was just kind of a year to get James Bolden experience. And I knew he'd struggle against, you know, the pass, but... He was a good player against the run. I thought a really good player against the run and hopefully develops into more of a three down player. But going forward, I do want to keep playing with this same style and I'm going to emphasize having linebackers that can also blitz and safeties who can man up on tight ends. That's why I keep going after these hybrid players. Even if they're lower overall, it's the style I want to play. Right now, I don't think we have a lot of cornerstone players to build around defensively, and it might get even more difficult this year if Demario Davis regresses further or retires. I mean, he's 35 years old. And then it's the issue of we need more cap space. Are we willing to trade Marshawn Lattimore to get that cap space? Trading Lattimore or Ramchak is uncomfortable, but it's the two best ways we can create space and get picks because we need that too. So overall, I'd say this was a year where you realize this team has a lot of work to do, and I feel like we got a good start with our rookie class. I mean, we had like four players with hidden dev, and even some of our normal dev players are going to contribute quite a bit. So, oh yeah, Tyrell Stoudemire too. The last two games he played, and I felt really confident with him out there, getting interceptions in each game, going head-to-head -head with the receiver he was matched up with. Not the toughest competition, but for his first two games, I was more than impressed with him. Overall this year, we did score 23.8 points per game, had a better offense in the first half of the year than the second. Defensively, we ranked towards the bottom in just about every category, giving up almost 5,000 passing yards and 500 plus points. 44% on third downs and then 51% on our fourth down conversions. And yeah, being minus 20 in turnover differential kind of puts you at a disadvantage. And for year three... We are going to be firing both our offensive and defensive coordinators looking for a fresh start in year three. I've already started the work on next year's playbooks and I want next year to be a lot more multiple in the run game. I want to spend more time under center as well. I still like using a lot of play action that helped us significantly in year one and I want to kind of get back to that identity going into season two. One thing I hope to do this offseason is also find a new fullback and I want to use a little more eye formation and offset eye to add more variety to the, the run game and what we can do with play action. Now, if we end up, you know, with like Pierman and Perry playing really well, we're still going to do a lot of three receiver stuff. But I think that I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket right now. 
I still have gone through the shotgun stuff as well. This box formation I wanted to get in here. It has a lot of pre-snap motion and uh, a couple different things I wanted. And then I got this deuce close in there because we didn't have like any too tight end shotgun stuff and I wanted the option to do that. Have some more RPOs in here and a couple play actions I like. I just really hope that in year three we can kind of blend the offense better and have the run and pass game kind of work off of each other and a lot of the same formations. And uh, hopefully that allows us to cut down on the turnovers, get better on third down, and hopefully make the most out of the talent we have. I'm also hoping that in the pass game the ball can come out a little bit quicker. And I've tried to find some more like catch and run opportunity plays and some different concepts that the playbook was lacking. So there are some formations I've added like this tight Y off flex I'm looking forward to using. When we had more success defensively late in that last quarter of the season, this was basically the play call for like half the game pretty much. I just call this over and over again. It worked pretty well. And the more aggressive defense with a lot of blitzing is going to continue. It's the style that I want to play and the style I want to get better at. So I've tried to add some formations that give me more of what I want to do. And this 2-4 odd has a lot more interesting zone blitzes I think I can add into next year's defense. Back inside of franchise, here are your league leaders for this year with Joe Burrow leading our franchise in passing yards this season. For touchdowns, it is Tua Tungavailoa with 40, as only a handful cleared 30 touchdowns this year. For interceptions, we had 27 as a team and Jason Tracy had 28. Kind of a rough year for the rookie in Tampa Bay. Josh Jacobs is the NFL's leading rusher at nearly six yards a carry with zero fumbles this year. Excellent season for him and the other big names in our franchise. Now, one thing I'm really excited about is that with my progression and regression sliders, these running backs should not stay at the top for forever. You know, we should see rookies pop up and start more next year and Regression hit a lot of these older running backs a little more heavily. At receiving, the leading receiver was Rasheed Rice of the Chiefs. Travis Kelsey had 112 receptions, and there were three players to clear 100 catches this year. And then Brandon Ayuk had 17 touchdowns. And Richard Keyes up here with 12 was one of the best rookie performers. I'll go through some of the best rookie performers. But defensively first, Anthony Walker had 139 tackles. Max Crosby, 22 sacks to lead the AFC. Chidobe Awuzie and Patrick Sertan each had five interceptions. And then in the NFC, for tackles, it is Demario Davis, who also had seven and a half sacks, 24 TFLs. We'll see if that helps out with his regression or what happens this offseason. But we do have a new record holder with Micah Parsons reaching 24 sacks. Grant Delpit had seven INTs, and I think I gave him two in that Eagles game. Then we had Darius Slay with six and a handful of players here reaching five, including Tommy Tomlinson. I'm fully expecting Jacoby Pierman to be a pro bowler. Like, who's going to beat him in the returning category? I don't see that happening. But he did miss out on Rookie of the Year, so he'll likely still be stuck at normal dev. But with this skill set, he's not the type of player that you need to, like, get all this improvement to make an impact. He has some of the best speed in our entire franchise. And that alone is going to be useful, and we've seen that on display a few times. In our franchise this year, there were only two rookie quarterbacks that got any real playing time. And that was Jason Tracy, and we got to know him playing him twice. And then the Vikings had selected at the very top of the second round, quarterback Chad Watkins. Now, we had the chance to take him instead of Tommy Tomlinson, and that would have given us a quarterback to develop now for the long haul. He does have a good arm, solid accuracies, and I thought he was a fine option. 
when you included the fact that he had injury concerns and I felt like we'd have future opportunities to draft a quarterback, I didn't want to take him. I assumed the next class would have more options and the class after that. Unfortunately, this year, we're kind of stuck where it's like, what are we even doing at quarterback going into year three? Which is part of why I'm trying to uh, emphasize the run game a bit more. But this was one of the first real domino effects in the franchise, passing on Watkins and now having the instability at quarterback that we have at least for the time being. Looks like Watkins had a pretty solid overall rookie season too. Our draft class in year one didn't have like any elite running back prospects. And the one who got the most playing time was Chris Robinson, who by the end of the year was the Buccaneers starter. He had a very inefficient 3.4 yards a carry, but did get 13 touchdowns. So he might be the Buccaneers running back going forward. And in his rookie year, that did include a pretty good game against us, where he ran for 188 yards. Justin Fields ran for over 1,000 yards this year to lead the Chicago Bears. There were a few rookies who got a fair amount of playing time, like Gabriel Sutton, but as far as taking over more premium roles, that hasn't happened a lot quite yet. I'm expecting a couple more rookies to take spots starting jobs next season. Chris Robinson, by the way, was the only rookie to lead their team in rushing this year in the franchise. If you're looking for receivers who made an early impact, the Dolphins spent an early pick on Richard Keyes. He outperformed Jalen Waddle this season and gives them an option to start preparing for maybe uh, once Tyreek Hill regresses or retires or whatever happens there. But Keyes... Has a uh, really solid skill set, great hands, good speed. Not great like Waddle and Tyreek, but he's a good player who got off to a strong start this year. And they also had a rookie starting tight end in Kirk McKee out of Notre Dame. Didn't have huge production, and I'll probably edit some more of these numbers and uh, like uniforms and stuff. I really focused mostly on doing that for teams we were going to play this year. And I'll do the same going into year two or year three. But uh, Kirk McKee, definitely the type of player I'm looking for in this coming off season. I want to get a, a good young tight end to develop. Not a rookie, but I did want to point out that Rashid Shahid left us in free agency and had 461 yards as a complimentary receiver with the Steelers. I'm not sure why they had to get Shahid and KJ Hamler, though. Michael Thomas, by the way, he led the Broncos in receiving yards and catches this year, so he played a pretty big role with them. There aren't a lot of rookies to break down here after year one. Like, there's only so much I can do with an incoming rookie class in the, the second year of a franchise. I think that the, the sliders I have will really start to affect things, you know, the deeper you get into the series. Wow, Leonard Floyd had 18 and a half sacks this year randomly for Denver. Kevin Parker, the rookie safety for the Broncos, had three INTs. Pretty good start to his career there. I'm not seeing too many rookies who put up big numbers defensively, but Paul Browning was a very early pick and he had five sacks as a rookie with Tennessee. The Bears' John Hernandez had four and a half at defensive tackle, and that was pretty close to leading their team. Hernandez, uh, 313 pounds, good run stopper, and got pretty good sacks for a guy who only has 70 power, 63 finesse. Oh, here we go. I missed this one. Joe Griffith for the Broncos, eight and a half at defensive tackle. Superstar development. So he's got uh, a chance to be a real star here for this Broncos defense after being the, wow, 19th pick in the third round. Luke Swinton, five and a half. He was one of the early picks for the Chargers. Here we've got the yearly awards, and this year's MVP is Joe Burrow. Mike McDaniel is coach of the year for the Dolphins. We'll go to the NFC here. Offensive player of the year is Brandon Ayuk with Micah Parsons on defense. Chris Robinson was named the offensive rookie of the year with all those touchdowns he was able to generate. 
And now we have to deal with him and his development in, in Tampa. Colin Detmer, Rookie of the Year with the Giants. We talked about him when we saw Tommy Tomlinson did not win. It is disappointing for us to not take either one of those Rookie of the Year awards when we had such a strong start. Tamario Davis was named best linebacker, however. And Blake Rupi best kicker. Here are the awards for the AFC. Jonathan Taylor is Offensive Player of the Year. And then Max Crosby on defense. Richard Keyes, productive receiver for the Dolphins, is number one. I wish they would like show stats on this page. It would make it a lot easier to get more information all at once here. Joe Griffith, we just saw him. He was Defensive Rookie of the Year. And then Tua, Taylor, Rasheed Rice, Creed Humphrey, Max Crosby, Alex Highsmith, and Chidobia Wuzie, along with, of course, Justin Tucker, take home those positional awards. Here are the free agents we have for this coming off season. Paulson Adebo is a key player who's played a lot of snaps for us. Jawan Johnson has started that tight end. Pete Werner, he's kind of like the guy you'd like to take over for Demario Davis. I know other than James Bolden, but uh, it's going to be hard to keep him around. Jawan Jennings, AJ Epinesa, more role players here who don't have critical roles but still don't have a lot of cap space to fill up this roster. And then we have our fifth-year option decisions, and they're, they're pretty easy ones. We're going to pick up Olave's and decline Pennings. This year in the franchise, the Dolphins were the best team in the league with a 15-2 record. Cowboys 13-4, Bills 12-5 along with the Chargers. Chiefs had 11 wins, same with the Cardinals, Packers, Eagles, Raiders, the Vikings... I'm not used to seeing them be any good in franchise mode. And sometimes not that good in real life either. But 10 wins for them, Seahawks, Panthers, Ravens. Nobody with single-digit victories. Oh, I'm sorry. The Jaguars are division champs at 8-9. and nine. So never mind. But the Browns had the worst record this year in the franchise. The Rams behind them, then the Bucks, And then you get us. We pick at 5 the Jets had the same amount of victories. Then Colts, Texans, Steelers, Bears only had six. So why don't we go through this playoff bracket a little bit. We've got the Cowboys as the one seed. The Dolphins as the one seed. What do we got through Wild Card Weekend? Well, Green Bay beats Minnesota 28-21. The Panthers win and move on to face Dallas. Chiefs and Dolphins in the playoffs. That sounds somewhat familiar. And then we got the Jags and the Chargers. On to championship weekend. And we've got the Arizona Cardinals moving on along with the Jaguars. So we got the one seed and the four seed in the AFC. The one and the two in the NFC. A lot of close games too. Big win here for the Dolphins. 45 points against the Chiefs. Five touchdowns for Tua Tungavailoa. All he had to do was play this game at home. Four touchdowns to the rookie Richard Keys. And the Super Bowl matchup will be those two one seeds. We know the Cowboys are pretty nasty here in franchise. Uh, they had to beat Clayton Toon in this start. Well, uh, Kyler Murray did start the game, and then Clayton Toon had a uh, relief pitch here, long relief, and did a pretty good job, it appears. But Cowboys hold on. Wow, Bryce Young, a pro bowler along with Jordan Love. No surprises in the AFC with Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. And then at running back, you've got mostly the big names here. At receiver now, we got Jamar Chase, Rasheed Rice, Adam Phelan with the Panthers makes it. Keenan Allen with his new team in Atlanta. Ayuk, Cup, Christian Kirk, Diggs. Devontae Smith, Scary Terry, Tyler Boyd, Hayden Hurst, Dallas Goddard, TJ Hawkinson. Then you've got Kelsey, Gerald Everett, Michael Mayer. For offensive line, I could see us sending Ramchek to the Pro Bowl. Mostly the big names here. Garrett Bradbury, actually a Pro Bowler. Austin Corbett. We do not have any offensive line Pro Bowlers from our squad. 
On defense, you got Sweat, Max Crosby, John Franklin Myers, Leonard Floyd had a great season. Not seeing too many rookies make it either. Demario Davis is a pro bowler at least, so we're not going to have nobody here. And then we get down to the specialists, and you're telling me LaVisca Chenault beat out Jacoby Pierman? He returned three kicks and only returned nine punts. Maybe they're factoring in his offensive numbers, and those are also lower than Pierman's. What's going on here? And the champions for next year will be the Dallas Cowboys, who blow out Miami in the Super Bowl and have won the two Super Bowls in our series. Dak Prescott, Super Bowl MVP. And now as a sneak peek of the offseason, we're going to start here with our retirements. And the Saints have a few. Ooh, Taysom Hill and Demario Davis are both retiring, along with free agent pickups we had, uh, two mentors in Jason Verrett and Anthony Barr. So after a phenomenal Pro Bowl season, we're going to have to replace Demario Davis. And Taysom Hill is not going to be here to be our answer at fullback, tight end, backup quarterback, punt protector, none of that. Kirk Cousins retires. That's a big one. Lane Johnson Zach Martin, Travis Kelsey retires, Von Miller, oh, and also Joe Flacco. I want to see how much cap space we're looking at. 41 million. Taysom Hill and Demario Davis retiring just saved us a boatload of cash. Both guys were set to make pretty big money next year. That's big. That could be the difference in bringing someone back that we otherwise wouldn't have. However, Paulson Adebo, Jawan Johnson, not really interested. It might allow us to bring back Werner or at least look at other options in free agency. I loaded up my backup file here because I wanted to see exactly how much we just save with those retirements. Demario Davis was set to count $15.8 million against the cap, and that's the same for Taysom Hill. So over $31 million just from those two retiring, which... Could keep us from having to uh, make any other serious moves, but there's still the issue of needing more picks. Okay, this might actually work out. Yeah, we can actually save a lot of money by releasing Derek Carr. So we're going to have cap space suddenly this offseason. So keep that in mind as we... Think about what we're going to do this offseason. And by the way, I'm expecting that I'll be streaming this one live probably Friday afternoon evening is when I think I'll be able to do that one. But we'll close it out here with a little look at the upcoming draft class. And I've spent some time in recent videos going through players that are on my radar. The first thing we have to do is decide what's the best thing to do at five. We have some edge rushers and tackles, and I think both are in play, especially if we end up moving on from Ryan Ramchek. And the better these tackles look, the more we should be willing to make that move. But I'm not totally convinced here with Conrad Kiernan because when I take a tackle this early, they better be proficient in pass protection when he seems to be similar to Trevor Penning skill set wise. The next guy, James Wheeler, is a better pass protector, but I wouldn't draft him with the information we have here. I need more. And it just seems that so many players are injury prone, and I'm not sure if that's, you know, them just wanting, like more injuries in the future of franchise or what it is, but it seems like everybody's got D or F. I'd probably want to make Taekwon Hickson one of our private workout players to see if he could maybe be a good option for us in the first. But the top of this draft is filled with tackles and edge rushers. And we have to see also if the teams ahead of us are likely to take an edge rusher. I do like Javier Garland a lot as an option. He is third on the board. Looks to be an elite level athlete. And I do like that he'll likely have high finesse moves, but power moves is a C. Block shed is a C. So he's not totally one dimensional. 
Dalton Webb might be my favorite option so far. I have the most info on him. He's an elite athlete. He's got good size at 270 pounds. I'd feel good about moving him all around the line inside sometimes in those sub packages. Like who doesn't want to just put their best rusher on a center every now and then? I feel like that works all the time. A finesse moves on him. C power. I think he's got uh, the ceiling that I'm looking for. But with four teams ahead of us, will he be there? I also like Manny Carr, but I worry once you go down too far, you might not get those premium developments. I'm not expecting a 23-year-old edge rusher to have anything better than star dev at this range. But Carr looks to be a solid option, but I think he's definitely a teardrop from the top guys. And then there's also safeties up here, and I'm not thinking I'll take a safety at five, but we could use a, a really good upgrade at safety. We've had two lower 70 overall players. It's uh, a spot where I think we have to look for better talent if I'm going to be playing a lot of man coverage with those safeties. They've got to have the athleticism and the skill to man up on tight ends, and you're not going to find those guys all the time very late. So Simon Carter is projected to go in the top 10. And then a player I know I like a lot in Marcus Caldwell has round one ability. Might not be the guy at five, but if we were in a position to trade back, get a mid-round pick, take a guy like Caldwell at like 10, that also is one of our options. This class was meant to be strongest at receiver, safety, and quarter positions that are only slightly on my radar and then weak for interior offensive line and quarterback. And one of the big questions for us says, now it's saying we pick at four. All right, we're up a spot apparently. But is this going to be enough draft capital to make us better in year three is kind of the ultimate question. Only three picks in the top 100, one in the top 67. I think it's an offseason full of difficult decisions, but I, I do think it's going to be fun to, you know, have a chance to release Derek Carr, have some cap space, and maybe actually get some upgrades in free agency after all. This year, I had our scouts really focus on the defensive ends and pass rushers. The players I have the most info for seem to have worse talent than their projection. Luckily, we have great players at the very top and have a good chance to take one at four. I'm not sure yet if I'm willing to move down because I really like Dalton Webb, but I might not have a chance to take him. I also like Andrew Madden quite a bit, who is 21 years old, has the elite athleticism. When you have that combine and age combination, you tend to get really good development. So Andrew Madden is very high on my board, and I do kind of prefer power rushers over finesse as well. I'll have to see where Madden is going in those mock drafts, but I think as far as like trade back options who have that uh, high upside, I only have a couple players that I'd put into that category. Manny Carr also looks pretty solid, but B finesse, C power, I'd like to get an A trait there if I'm taking a first round edge rusher, especially at 23 years old, so I'd kind of knock him down a little bit. And then for outside linebackers, here is Bryce Gray, who is another power rusher at 21 years old, but he's not an elite athlete, he's just solid, and he has A to C power moves with C finesse moves. Probably a good player if you trade back more significantly in the first round into the later teens or 20s. And then one of the more complete players could be Juan Beard out of Florida. So with a lot of these pass rushers, you tend to get, you know, maybe A at their dominant pass rush skill and C if you're lucky at the other one. With Beard, you've got great athleticism, not top tier, but above average. A finesse, B power, B block shed. He could be the guy to target. And maybe a player to spend a workout on just to, we can probably finish his uh, profile then, get his talent, and then know if he has uh, awareness as an A, because that would make him like a lock. One beard looks really good. So there are excellent options to find that pass rusher. Like, what I want to be able to accomplish this year 
I think would be a successful draft if we got a great upper tier pass rusher, a run stopping defensive tackle, a tight end, and then a linebacker or safety. Four players who can be heavy contributors. And right now we pick three times inside the top 100. That's where I think we need to get one more pick. But I did go over one of my favorite options here at D-Tackle, Justin Medlock. 371 pounds. We need someone who can get in the way of these running games. Great to elite strength. Great to elite acceleration as well. With B block shed, B power moves. I want Justin Medlock. And then we go to, let's go linebacker. I like Jacobs and Pittman quite a bit. Each has cover skill, three down upside, and I think can start right away. And so we've got to make a call now. We've got James Bolden, and then are we going to offer Pete Werner $7 million a year because he's solid, or look elsewhere in free agency, possibly taking someone like Jacobs? Now that we're missing Davis, we have to prioritize getting somebody at linebacker that can cover. With the way I play my defense, the linebackers are going to be in man coverage a lot, and they're going to have to be proficient in coverage, whether it's man or zone. So we can't really just wait around here. And then with Jawan Johnson not interested in returning, I have a long list of tight ends here that I like. My favorites were Cam Graham, I liked Kevin Blackwell and Eddie Lovelock. And then also LaMarcus Callaway is uh, a good option too, 6'4", 240. I would like to get someone who could help us in the running game, but it's not a necessity because I tend to, uh, I want to play two tight ends a fair bit. And we just played two years with Jawan Johnson, who is not a blocker. So a lot of these players can fill his role as far as the receiving goes, but there are players too that can actually block. Kevin Blackwell at 270 pounds also has great to elite strength with great to elite speed. This combination has me really excited if he's really there in the middle of the draft. Eddie Lovelock seems like a small step down with the same kind of skill set where he offers receiving athleticism and the strength and blocking ability to help out there. I got to come away with one of these two guys, I feel. And it is a really strong receiver class. I just don't see us going in that direction. But there are good deep threats and some really intriguing players that will go here. And I think next season you're going to see much of our league have these players play a huge role in their offense. One guy I want to keep an eye on, his future is Clay Addison. Six foot four, 233. He's mostly an athletic freak, but he's raw has to go somewhere that can develop him a little bit but he's probably gonna have uh, a really high ceiling wherever he ends up i really can't wait to get on to year three of this series and i hope you are as well leave your thoughts down below on what you'd like to see us do during this upcoming off season how should we approach free agency and the draft i think we've got some good opportunities now with these retirements and maybe releasing Derek carr we should have some money to spend do we go and chase somebody like Tua, or how do we handle that cap space? Leave your thoughts below, and I'll see you all in the offseason later this week, Friday until further notice. Have a great day, everybody, and I will see you next time.